Today's reading is a wonderful conclusion of chapter 10 in Mark's Gospel, and it tells the story of blind Bartimaeus. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. He cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. What do you want me to do for you? This is a very straightforward question that elicits a very straightforward reply. My teacher, let me see again. Jesus and the blind man Bartimaeus are not playing games here. Bartimaeus knows his need desperately. And Jesus must have been relieved to hear a response that was not an attempt to manipulate him, but just a clear cry for help. When I was a young priest, there was a contemporary Christian song about the blind man and Jesus. A blind man sat by the road and he cried, and so on and so on. I suspect that it's not often sung these days, partly because it's fallen foul of political correctness, but also because it's a bit of a whiny old song that can't really be improved even with contrapuntal clap clapping. How different is this exchange between Jesus and Bartimaeus from the previous passage in Mark, which shows James and John, two of Jesus' inner circle, trying to find positions of power and prestige by asking Jesus to give them what they want. When Jesus says to them, what is it you want me to do for you? James and John prevaricate and try to hide the raw ambition in their request Jesus is not fooled. You do not know what you are asking, he says. Nevertheless, in both of these exchanges, Jesus tries to hear and respond with love. Clearly, it's blind Bartimaeus who looks like the genuine article. James and John manage to reduce themselves, being overambitious self servers but it's worth noting, though, that Jesus does respond appropriately to both questioners, to both demands on his attention and power. He dismisses neither Bartimaeus nor James and John. In spite of their misunderstanding, Jesus does promise James and John their place in the coming kingdom. These two terrific stories are juxtaposed for maximum effect. The blind man can see and the sighted men are blind. This is how it is in the kingdom of God. Values are turned upside down because the primary law is love and not justice or reward. What do we hear in these stories? I think that the question that Jesus asks is the centre of what is going on, not only for James and John and for Bartimaeus, but also for us. What do we want Jesus to do for us? Or even more pointedly, what do I want Jesus to do for me? How we respond to this question reveals the authentic authenticity of our dependence on the God of grace, mercy and forgiveness. At one level, it's easy to answer the question, what do I want Jesus to do for me? 
I'd like to be younger, thinner, smarter, more competent at my work. I'd like the admiration of my friends and colleagues. I'd prefer not to feel rejected, lonely or an outsider ever again. I'd also prefer my more financial security, maybe through an unexpected tax lotto event. These are the easy answers because really they don't matter to us all that much. If we come to the question more truthful, truthfully, we might be facing some of our real fears of COVID or cancer or abandonment by those we love the most, a deep existential anomie or meaninglessness may be the thing from which we most desperately wish to be saved. Or perhaps there's an almost inexpressible terror that all this religious thought and experience may be no more than self-delusion. The more authentically we respond to Jesus' question about what we want him to do for us, the closer we come to understanding our own complexities and also the overwhelming attitude of Jesus, which is always for our good and our fulfilment and our joy. When we hear Jesus ask, what is it we want him to do for us? We are really beginning to enter the longest and most complex journey of our lives, a journey inward. For most of us, this is a slow unfolding of ourselves before the holy good God revealed in Jesus. What do we want Jesus to do for us? Perhaps to start, we might ask for courage to see ourselves as we truly are, and then to ask for strength that we might be changed from one degree of glory to another. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give to us the increase of faith, hope and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us to love what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, today and always. Amen.